Amen, amen, amen. Blessings to you. Can I ask you just to turn to your neighbor and say, I bless you in the name of Jesus. That you be filled with joy. You know that we've got another family member in the house. It's Pastor Lloyd here. Yes. Can you stand, Pastor Lloyd? Thank you for being here. And just uh, corner him after this uh, sermon, after this time with the Lord and find out how he and his family are doing. It's wonderful to have him. Thank you, Pastor Lloyd. You know, before I go any further, Helen asked me, um, I'm just being vulnerable. Helen asked me, when your granddaughter is born, what do you want to call, call yourself? I said, well, uh, what do you mean? Uh, my name is Kevin Ward. And she said, no, no, are you going to be grandpa? Are you going to... Suddenly hit me. I'm going to be a grandfather. <laughs> I said, no, 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 I'm a Liswati. I'm a proper Liswati. I want to be known as cool." <laughs> So, uh, Stevie Joy Ward, it's a total delight and privilege. We celebrate Joshua and Caroline. It's such a privilege to see their family expanding. They've been married more, more than five years. So, praise the Lord. Amen. You know, when God told me that there's going to be a harvest, I, I didn't expect the family to expand in such a way. But anyway, <laughs> in 2024, as we opened up 2024, I don't know if you remember, but I really felt like God was saying, this is going to be a year of supernatural hope. This is going to be a year of open doors. This is going to be a year of the prodigals returning. This is going to be a year of harvest, a time of harvest. And as we consider the time of harvest and what I believe God is doing, I think it's really important to understand that if you want to harvest, either in relationships, in church growth, or if you want to harvest in finances, if you want to harvest in what God has called you to harvest, I think it's really important that we understand we've got to pursue God first. Tell your neighbor, pursue God first. And as you pursue God first, there's this, there's this amazing question that has to come because as I, as I sit with people over the last 25 years, I have found that when we talk about a move of God and a harvest of God, and we talk about open doors, and we talk about God's provision and the prodigals coming home, I often hear people say, what about my future? What about my education? What about my finances? What about my house? What about my promotion. And I recognize as I hear that, that my mine, mine is a common battle cry, unfortunately. And I need us to understand that as the harvest, and I really believe that this year there's going to be a supernatural bump where God is bringing in a massive harvest, not just to the church, but also of hope that there's going to, this is going to be a year of open doors, of hope, of expansion of God's kingdom in whatever you're doing for God to advance his kingdom. But in saying that, we need to get a few things right. And the first question I have, the title of the message is, who's the owner? Ask your neighbor, who's the owner? This is important because many haven't really answered this question and a lot of people trip on this question. It's vital that we get a grasp here because our view of God's role in the harvest our rule, our view of God's role in our life and our view of God, our, our view of our role in our life will change the way we see things and the way we behave. The way we view God's role or the way we view our role will impact us. And I want to take what Jesus says in Matthew 24. If you go to Matthew 24, please, and, and just consider... 20, sorry, 25, verse 1, verse 14. The scripture says, For the kingdom of heaven, and, and, and I know you know this parable that he speaks, but I, I want us to have a look at this parable. It's the parable of how Jesus talks about how he gives one person five talents, another one two, and another one one. And I want us to look at this because I believe there's some nuggets in here. As we look at Matthew 25, verse 14, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country, who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. He called his own servants, delivered his goods to them. Do you know that God calls himself about 250 different names throughout scripture? 
about 250 names. But if you had to sum up the most common name, it is the name Lord. The name Lord. And so the first point I want to make this morning that I believe is the heart of the Father for us in this season is to recognize the Lord is owner of all. The Lord is owner of all. The Lord claims comprehensive ownership. There are no other owners. As I share that, consider this for a moment. In Psalm 24 verse 1, he says, The earth is the Lord's and its fullness. The world and those who dwell, the world and those who dwell in it. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. So let's recognize that the Lord is saying, I'm the creator of the universe. I formed you in your mother's womb. I separated you for a plan and purpose. And so the Lord is saying he's the Lord of all things and there's only one owner. Colossians 1.17 says, in him all things are held together. In 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19, he says, did you not know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who's in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's, which are God's. God owns that. So even our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit for the Lord. After God created the heavens and the earth, he created man in his own image. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over all the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, of every living thing that moves on the earth. The word dominion here means rule, manage, supervise. You could sum it up with the word steward. And David reinforces this tr truth where he says, you made mankind rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet. You made Mankind, rulers over the works of your hands, and you put everything under their feet. Let me say it again. God claims comprehensive ownership. He's the Lord of all. And when we allow him to be Lord of all, he is then able to be for you the way maker, the miracle worker, the promise keeper, light in the darkness. He brings life and abundant Zoe life. By the way, he brings life even when people are stealing. I mean, just think for a moment. Judas, one of the disciples, is in charge of the treasury for Jesus as the disciples and the apostles walk through Israel. Judas is stealing from the treasury finances for himself. But Jesus is there, and because Jesus is the owner of all, and he knows Judas is stealing, still there's financial provision because it's his. So much so that when Peter owes taxes, <laughs> the Lord says to Peter, well, go down to the sea there, catch a fish, and open the fish, and pull a coin out of the mouth of the fish, and go and pay your temple taxes. Jesus takes the five loaves the, and he takes the fish and he, he multiplies it. So when we make Jesus Lord of all, Jesus can work through that. He's the creator. He's the redeemer. He's the restorer of the years the locust is devout. He's the healer. When you've got Jesus in the boat with you, he can stand up and speak to the storm and say, peace, be still. Then you allow the resurrection power of God to flow in you. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is available to you, to flow through you. In John 14, 21, Jesus said, He who has my commandments and keeps to them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I'll love him and make myself manifest 
will manifest myself to him, will reveal myself to him, will show myself to him. So when we make him our foundation where he's Lord of all, then you have the right foundation. Think about this for a moment. How was Moses able to leave the palace where he had been earmarked to be potentially raised up as a future Pharaoh, trained in leadership, all the palatial benefits. But he leaves that to suffer in the wilderness. How is it that he can leave that and suffer in the wilderness? Because he knows God is Lord and that God can restore. God can redeem those years that have been lost. God can reconcile, God can heal, God can provide. Think about Job. Job goes before the Lord and he's worshiping Lord. And, and, and as he, he starts to hear that his children have died, his house has collapsed, his livestock is wiped out, his financial assets are, are gone, burnt. He has nothing left. And yet Job is still able to worship the Lord, having lost everything. How? Because he knows God is Lord and Lord of all. And he knows the Lord can re restore and can reconcile, that the Lord can create miracles. I, I was thinking for a moment about um, a punch bag. And um, if you, in my university years, they used to have this punch bag with a weight at the bottom of it. And as the students would go into to the gym, some of them would work out their frustrations on the punch bag and you'd punch that bag and that bag would go down, bam, and it'd come back up, bing, punch it again, bam, come back up, bing. And, and so sometimes it would go, bam, and stay down, and, but it'd come bing again. And I, one person went into the gym and saw him kick the bag. He was so frustrated. And the bag went flying and, and then it went, bam, down on the ground and then swung to the other side, bam, but it came back up and went bing. And I want to put it to you like this. In life, sometimes we take a smack, bam, the business has lost finances, bam, you've lost a job. But when God is Lord of all, a man can fall seven times, but he rises up again. Bam, bing, bam, bing, in Jesus' name. Sorry, can you say with me, bam, 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 bam bing. bing. So when you make Jesus Lord of all, then the weight of the bag, the weight of your life is founded correctly. You found it and no matter how many times you knock down, you're coming back up again because he's the redeemer. He's the restorer. He's the way maker. He's the promise keeper in Jesus name. Can I ask you to ask your neighbor, is he Lord of all? Listen to this again. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country. And we know Jesus is speaking and Jesus, he went to the cross. He paid the price. He died. He was raised from the dead and he went to heaven. He went to a far country, but he's coming again. And it's like a man who's traveling to a far country, called his own servants and delivered his goods to him. To one, he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. Listen to this, each according to their own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. So Jesus is Lord of all. So then what are we? Second point, we are his stewards. Right from the beginning, when God placed man in this homestead, in a well-treated garden, in a garden he called Eden, filled, teeming with life. He called us to be stewards. Listen to this in Genesis 2.15. Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. The role of man was to tend and keep it, to manage it, to look after it, to care for it, to expand it, to improve it, to steward it. We are his stewards. Our role is as stewards. The Greek word for steward is the word oikonomos, and it translates into manager, overseer, 
supervisor. If you took a word to sum that up, it would be the word steward. And in scripture, the word steward, the word steward in scripture is a position of great authority. It's the person who is responsible directly under the owner, the chief steward. Joseph was a steward underneath Pharaoh. God uses this word as pointing out that that person is under the master and has full responsibility for the master's possessions and his household affairs. Listen to what David says. He says in Psalm 8 verse 5, for you have made him, talking about man, a little lower than the angels, and you've crowned him with the glory and honor. You've made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. So as sons and daughters, we are his stewards. And as a steward, one's chief responsibility, one's chief responsibility is to be faithful. In 1 Corinthians 4, 2, he says, moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful because stewardship is to protect, to expand the resources of another, of another person. Some might be sitting there and thinking this morning, but you know, no one gave me a hand up in life. I work by the sweat of my brow. I'm a self-made man. God didn't help me. I had to do it myself. I stayed up late at night in anxiety and fear and pushing through it. It was by my sweat. But listen to Deuteronomy 8 verse 18. You shall remember the Lord your God. It is he who gives you power to get wealth. Why? That he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is this day. Even skills that you've got are from the Lord that you have to steward. But one of the skills God can give you is the ability to create wealth. It's a gift from the Lord. Promotion is from the Lord. Demotion is from the Lord. Look at Psalm 75 verse 6. For exaltation, which is promotion, comes neither from the north or the east, not from your supervisor or from uh, your favorite grandfather who's promoted you. So, so the scripture says the promotion doesn't come from the north or from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. Promotion comes from God. Can you tell your neighbor, promotion comes from God? Some of us are so frustrated that they're not being recognized and not climbing up the ladder. The doors aren't open. We've said this is a year of hope. The doors are going to open. And some of you are frustrated that the doors haven't opened for you. Remember, Jesus is Lord of all. He's even the Lord of the door that opens for promotion, but he's also the Lord of the door that opens for demotion. Don't think it's your boss who's just dealing with you. It's God. There are about 500 scriptures in the Bible on prayer. There are less than 500 on faith. But there are more than 2,350 scriptures on finances and how you handle finances. That's a lot. Jesus speaks more about finances than he does heaven and hell. Because he knows that we are tempted by the spirit of mammon, by the love of money. And so he addresses this over and over again. It's Jesus who says that no man can serve two masters. He'll either hate the one and love the other. It's Jesus who says you cannot love God and mammon. So I have a question for you. Are you a, an owner or a steward? And this is important. Otherwise, pressure comes. It's time to get our foundation right especially in this season. Are you the owner or the steward? I believe as, as doors of hope open, as the harvest is being made available, as opportunities are provided, as prodigal sons and prodigal daughters come back into the house, we have to be positioned where we recognize the Lord is Lord of all that we have. Our position is as a steward.
And we are to hold things lightly, to be guided by God. Listen to verse 15. He gave one five talents to another two and to the other one one, each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. So I want to put it to you that the struggle is real. And the struggle I'm talking about is the struggle of giving everything to God. By the way, I said to God, I didn't say to the church. When the Lord is Lord of all, many people think that means that you have to give it all to the church. No. The Lord is Lord of all. We become stewards of the resources we have to steward as God wants us to give it, led by him. And the struggle that we go through is we give it to the Lord, but we keep taking it back. We give it to the Lord, we keep taking it back. And I, for example, you might have a job, you might own a business, and maybe a family member comes up to you and says, listen, you've got a business that you own, you're doing very well. Please, could you take your business and give me some cash? I need 10,000, please, because this 10,000 will pay for me to be able to do the following. And you think to yourself, yes, I have this position. This company is doing well. I better give it because the Bible says, I, and they'll think of a scripture that says you need to give. And I want to warn you, first of all, that company that you run is a separate legal entity. It's not yours to dip your hand into. Secondly, that company is the Lord's, isn't it? And so before you give, you, you need to align with the law and you need to align with God and say, Father, do you want me to give or not? But sometimes people make us feel so guilty. You've got this and you've got that. You need to give. And yes, we'd love to give. And the fruit must be there that we are going to give. But the question is, is he Lord of your bank account? Is he Lord of the car that you drive? Or are you the owner? It's gone quiet in the house today. <laughs> it's really quiet. You know, Jesus said in Luke 14, verse 33, he said, So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. He's not saying that you give it all away. He's saying that you put it under the lordship of Jesus Christ and that you walk as Jesus' steward. You know, a good picture of this is the Crusaders in the 12th century. They wanted to go to uh, Jerusalem and retake Jerusalem. And so they, they encouraged people to join the Crusaders. And some of the people they encouraged were mercenaries. And as the mercenaries joined the Crusaders to march across to Jerusalem, the church decided these mercenaries, they were bloodthirsty killers. They were paid high killers. And, and, and so they needed to be baptized themselves. And, and so they required all the mercenaries be baptized. And so they got baptized. But the one thing they did is they left their one hand, their fighting hand. Tell your neighbor, fighting hand. They left their fighting hand with a sword out of the water. And what they were saying is, Lord, I give you my whole life, but not my fighting hand and not my sword, because I, will, I, I need to be able to fight. I need to kill whoever I want to kill. And, and I think that many of us actually are a little like that, where we get baptized and we give everything to Jesus, except not the wallet, except not the keys of the car, except not the career, except not my relationships, except not my future. And we keep this hand out of the water instead of giving it all to Jesus. And that's the real struggle that goes on with us. And some of us, we keep the hand of culture out. And some of us keep the hand of our relationships out. And Jesus says, give it all. Because God gives you time. All of us have got the same 24 hours. He gives us talent. But he also gives us his resources. You know, in Matthew 7, 24, Jesus talks about getting the foundations right. He talks about a house that's built on the rock and a house that's built on the sand. The house that's built on a rock is a house that's built on the rock Jesus, on the word of God. And the house that's built on the sand is, sand represents human reasoning. And the two people are, have the same vision. They want to build a house. They both want to build a house. They want to build a future. They want to build a life. They want to build a family. They both got the same vision. 
They both heard the same sermon from Jesus. They hear God. And so they start building. But when the storm comes, tell your neighbor, when the storm comes. When the storm comes, what actually happens when the storm comes, not if the storm comes, when the storm comes, weapons will be formed against you, but they shall not prosper. When the storm comes, now you see the separation between who's foolish and who's wise. It's the storm that reveals who's foolish and wise. And the one that's built on the sand, on human reasoning, on human culture, on human thinking, on human information, the one who follows the culture of the day, looking after self, built on sand, when that storm comes and the wind comes, and recently we had those horrible winds that hit the middle just below Manzini, and, and the wind was pounding against houses, and the hail damaged roofs and took roofs and slates off and damaged buildings and crashed windows, and it's a big storm that comes, and the house that built on the sand fell, but the house that was built on the rock, the word of God, where he's Lord of all, it stood. It's the storm that revealed whether they were wise or foolish. In the same way, this morning, we need to recognize we're either building on the rock, Jesus, his word, where he's Lord of all and we're stewards, or we are building on sand, human reasoning, I don't know about you, but I enjoy apples. Helen's always got the fridge full of apples. And uh, they say an apple a day keeps the doctor away. I enjoy an apple after I've run or just before I've run and uh, enjoy an apple in the evening. It's, by the way, it's full of good stuff. And, uh, but if you go to a fair, you can find an apple there that's been dipped into caramelized sugar, covered with this lovely caramelized sugar. <laughs> I, and uh, I don't know about you, but I enjoy those caramelized sugar apples. They're really good. But you know, the nutrition of an apple is excellent. But once you eat an apple that's caramelized, you neutralize everything that's good in it. One is good for you, but the other one that's dipped into caramelized sugar has no benefits to you. It looks good, it tastes good, but it has no benefits. And human reasoning, sand, has no benefits eternally to you. It's like caramelized apple. But if you build on the rock, it's the apple that brings nutrition. He's the one that brings life. God brings life in Jesus' name. So when we steward money, let's keep this in mind. It's not, Lord, what do you want me to do with my money? Rather, it's, Lord, what do you want me to do with your money? How do you want me to steward this? Should I be giving this money to this person? Should I be lending this person your car? Should I minister? Oh, by the way, in marriage, it's wonderful. Tell your neighbor, wake up. <laughs> I've learned in marriage to recognize that when I'm going through a tough time, I'm on my knees before the Lord, and I say, Lord, Helen is your daughter. In the name of Jesus, Lord, it's your daughter. How do you want me to minister more effectively to your daughter? I just want to share a quick secret on that. It works. Tell your neighbor, it works. Because God formed us in the mother's womb, and God wants to reveal how to be more effective to his daughter. So you can call it your marriage, but it's her, it's God's daughter. It's God's son. It's important, but I, I want to also bring out to you that, you know, in this battle, the struggle of, me, myself, and I, and where does the Lord fit in, in stewardship? We also struggle with our thoughts, don't we? And, and, and in our thoughts, you know, there's the poverty mindset. And believe me, there really is a poverty mindset. I just want you to have a look at this. There's this wrong thoughts and extreme poverty mindset. And we see this a lot where people believe possessions of e are evil. They, they, if you're re Some people believe if you're a Christian and you've got a whole lot of accumulated stuff and you've got lots of nice cars, that's evil. Some people believe that. It's not true. It's a false mindset. It's wrong, but people believe that. And, and they go to work only to meet their basic needs. They go to work because they need a job and I owe, I owe, it's off to work, I go, and they, they earn a salary. And that salary meets their basic needs and they go to work for 
basic needs to be met. Do you know that's a poverty mindset? God came to give life, an abundant life. God wants you to change your view. And un- ungodly, and they believe that godly people are poor, are supposed to be poor. You know, you know how many people in Eswatini, they want to see people walking by the road with holes in their shoes, but not driving a fancy car. As soon as they see someone driving a fancy car, they're, how did he get the money? He must have done something wrong. What kind of drug dealing is he involved in? We need to check his life. Hey, hey there's something going on there. But because we have a poverty mindset that's not of God. That's not God. And they believe that ungodly people are wealthy. Because they've got accumulated stuff, they must have done it the wrong way. But, but look at this. They believe that a poverty mind says, I give because I must. I'm obligated because if I give, then God must give back to me. I do it because I have to. Not as an act of worship. Do you know that God says it's more blessed to give than to receive? And our spending when we go to the shops is done without gratitude to God. It's like, oh, I have to buy that. We've got the wrong attitude. That's a poverty mindset. But on the other extreme, far extreme, is this prosperity mindset, which is just as strong. Look at this. Where possessions are my rights. God wants me healthy and wealthy. It's my right. I'm a born-again Christian. I should be healthy and wealthy. It's the way God wants me. I work to become rich. That's a prosperity mindset. God uses work as a tool to steward our characters. God is the provider, not jobs. Godly people are therefore, there's this belief that if you're a Christian, you must be wealthy. You must, if you're in Fundis, you must have a very nice car. You must have big shoes and you must have a nice jacket. Oh, you must walk like you're a million dollars because you're representing God. Jesus didn't even have a place to lay his head. Jesus is our role model. And then I give in order to get because, you know, there's this formula. If you give to the anointed uh, pastor, then you catch his anointing. Ha! (laughs) Do you know who's the anointed one? Jesus. It's Jesus we go after. You want to tap into the pastor's anointing. Stop idol worshiping. Tap into Jesus. He gives you the anointing, not this idol. In Jesus' name. And then we go to this place of my spending when I, I'm prosperous is carefree and consumptuous. It's all for me. Myself, I give because it's all accumulated wealth for myself to feel comfortable. That is not right. Let me show you stewardship because if you're a steward, And this battle is going on between poverty and prosperity. And I I want to tell you, I've battled with the poverty mentality. I've thought I need to keep shoes with holes and all sort of old shoes. And and the Lord's rebuked me and said, no, 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 listen, I'm the provider. Receive from me. But stewardship mindset says possessions are responsibility. Because he's told you to tend them and look after them, multiply them, bring out the beauty of them. I work in order to serve Christ. Can you tell your neighbor, I work to serve Christ. You go to work to serve Christ. And when you at work, God is building your character. He's testing you. He's challenging you. He's raising you. He's blessing you so that you can carry light, hope, and love to the people at work in Jesus' name. Don't think work is where you make money. God is Jehovah Jireh. Tell your neighbor, God is Jehovah Jireh. And in that, He says, godly people are faithful in the small things so that they can receive the true riches that come from God. Faithful. So many Christians, they're godly people, they go to work, but yet they're unfaithful. You know, they use the businesses photocopying machine, the business where they work, they're photocopying church doctrines, and they bring out these papers for the pastor. He has some papers. Oh, praise the Lord, the pastor says, he stole them. He stole time. He stole paper. He didn't get permission. It's theft. Tell your neighbor, you have time, time. talent, Talent. and resources. resources. So I have a question for you. Is he Lord of all? Or are you keeping your time? It's my time. I'm working, but it's my time. Ungodly people are unfaithful with their time, with their talent, and with their treasure. 
And the scripture tell, warns us that we give because we love God as an act of worship. And our spending is prayerful where we come back and say, Lord, what is it? You're the Lord of all. Do I buy this nice coffee or do I hold back in Jesus' name? How many of you enjoying coffee after the fast? Oh, praise God. <laughs> you know what? This is such a thing, big thing. The Lord's ownership influences how we care for possessions because when it's the Lord's, we take after it, look after it better. If it's the Lord's Bible, we'll look after it better. If it's the Lord's car, we'll steward it better. If it's the Lord's clothes, we'll steward it better. But it's easy to believe that God owns all things in the head intellectually, yet we still live as if it's not true. For example, when an extended family member comes to you and says, hey, hey, can I have 20,000 bucks? You've got 20,000 bucks and I need 20,000 bucks for my school fees. And you say, well, I better. No, is it the Lord's? Is it yours? You need to hear from the Lord. This is such a big issue that I, I've even seen people go to church and the music is going, the worship is wonderful, the pastor gets up. I was in one service, the pastor got up many years ago, so you can't work out where's church in Jesus' name. And the worship was wonderful. I was thoroughly enjoying it. And the, the pastor got up and said, you know, I feel like the Lord said, we need to take an offering and there's going to be an offering of 40,000 rand. So, and the worship's going and so the offering goes and he comes back and says, no, no, it was only 10,000. We have to stay a little longer. We went on for worship for another hour and a half. <laughs> waiting for people to give. But, but, but the truth is, that's manipulation and witchcraft. Because what's happening is, that person is trying to extort money out of people who haven't heard from the Lord. It's, you don't meet every need. You are obedient to what Jesus has told you. Hear what God tells you. I know this is tough. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. But in order for us to walk forward with a harvest that glorifies God... We need to get this right. This is so important that next week's sermon is, is entitled, Why We Give, When We Give, and Where Do We Give? Because I see a lot of manipulation going on. I, I hear prophets calling and saying, hey, I've got a prophetic word for you. Hey, if you give me 10,000 rand, man, I'll give you a great word. The Lord's given me a word for you. Would you pay me 10,000? And people are paying I've even heard of people who, who need a breakthrough. So they call someone and say, hey, can you pray for me? And the pastor says, yes, I'll pray for you. He comes back. He says, I prayed for you, but you need to seal the deal. You need to seal it with God. And the way you seal it is with 200,000 Malangeni. In his Latini. Why do we give? When do we give? And where to give? It's such a battle with our thoughts between a poverty mindset and a prosperity mindset instead of a steward mindset, Pastor Kurt, the following week after that, is going to be preaching on stewarding our thoughts. It's absolutely crucial to steward our thoughts. And Matthew 25, verse 16, Then he who received five talents went and traded them. He, he worked them and, and made another five talents. And likewise, he who received two talents gave two more also. But he who had received one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants will come and settle accounts with them. Came and settled accounts with them. Here's the fourth and final point. We will be held accountable. There's a time of reckoning. He says that we'll appear before the judgment seat of Christ for the good and the bad done whilst in the body. Sorry, but can I ask you to tell your neighbor, there is a time of accountability coming. And he's going to hold us accountable for our time that we've been given because we've got 24 hours in a day. And how did we spend that time? And this isn't heaping condemnation. This is just understanding that life is a sum conclusion of choices. We're either going to worship God and hear him, or we're going to go to the Google tree and get what human reasoning tells us. The second thing is that God gives every one of us talent. Everyone has been given talent and skills, and God gives us resources. And I know some people are sitting there and saying, but I don't have any resources. I don't have any money. I don't have doors opening. Can I tell you, you have resources. Tell your neighbor, I bless you, that your eyes be open to your resources. Let me tell you the resource you do have. You have words. God gave you the power of life and death on the tongue. That's why he calls you to prophesy. 
So you can speak life over situations. And when someone is battling, if, if I'm battling, Helen starts praying for me and she speaks life over me that I won't be so grumpy, that the Lord will give me the fullness of joy in the name of Jesus. Tell your neighbor, I bless you with joy. I, I, I'm telling you, God gives you words. Will you speak life? Will you speak death? And by the way, the, book, the word of God tells us in Matthew, Jesus said, we'll be held accountable for every idle word that we speak. He says it in the New Testament. In Malachi, he talks about a book of remembrance. We will be held accountable. And you've got words. You also have the word of God, which goes forth and doesn't return void. I remember a friend of mine. Um, I think one or two people will know him in the room. But many years ago, in, he came to a Swatini from South Africa. And he came to work for a fridge factory and he lost his job. He was devastated. And so he and I were praying together and I reminded him that he has resources. He has words and he has the word of God. And he came back to me and he said to me, hey, Kevin, you know what I found? I found the word of God says, if a man does not work, don't feed him. But the reverse works too. If a man works, God will feed him. Tell your neighbor, if a man works, God will feed him. It doesn't say if a man's got a job, God will feed him. He says, God says, if a man works, job and work are two different things. And so this man, he went to work and he went and served in a company for free for a whole year. He was there first thing in the morning before everyone else. He worked harder than everyone else. He finished later than everyone else. And every month the person paid him nothing, zero, mahala. And he was saying, but Kevin, nothing for mahala. What's going on? And so we prayed and prayed, but you know what? Every end of month, somehow outside of his house were plastic bags of food delivered. The fridge was full. Finances came in little envelopes. And what this man saw was God's supernatural provision that didn't come from work, from the job, but came from God through him working. And then a company approached him and offered him this amazing job, this incredible position in maintenance. And, and he became a maintenance director of a company. And two years later, that guy had earned so much money that he was able to move his whole family of four to Australia and buy a house. If a man doesn't work, don't feed him. But the reverse too, if a man works, God will feed him. And, and the point that I'm trying to bring here is you have resources in your words that you speak, but also with the word of God that God gives us. You also have the blood of Jesus. You have the grace of Jesus. You have the love of God, the father. You have the mind of Christ through the Holy Spirit. You have the gifts of the Holy Spirit and you have skills. Exodus 36, one, God pours skills into people. You can ask God to multiply the skills he's given you. He also gives you abilities. Tell your neighbor, I bless you with abilities. <laughs> Remember, the talents were given to each one according to his own ability. If you read that, you'll just think it's the English word ability because he had abilities. So some people had less abilities than other people. Oh, that's a bit unfair. But actually, if you look at 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, the scripture says this, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Let me tell you something. That word ability is the same word that's used for the word power, dunamis. So God gives talents according to the way you steward the dunamis, the power of God in you. This should excite you because it means that God has already given you power, love, and a sound mind. But now let the power of God, the word of God, the move of the spirit flow through you that you can do what God called you to do. You know, we've been battling in Bulembo. We've been battling for some time about these minds are trying to come to Bulembo and, and take Bulembo. And I've been praying for, for the last two, three years, Helen and I and the leadership have been praying, Lord, Lord, please, we don't have the financial resources. We don't have the human resource, but Lord, please, could you provide an alternative property that if the mine comes, we are able to relocate? Well, we've been praying and praying and seeking the Lord and speaking life and speaking life under the blood of Jesus with the grace of Jesus. Well, a couple of months ago, a friend of ours came out from UK and he was driving with me in the car. And as I'm driving up to Bulembo, up the Malagoan, he says to me, what's your biggest problem? And I said, well, 
The biggest problem is actually we need an alternative property. Could you pray with us we could have this alternative property? He says, have you got something in mind? I said, yes, actually, it's over there. It's 154 hectares. The next thing he says, I'll buy it. Now, we don't have the finances, but he paid for it. Look at this for a moment. Just watch this visual as you see this drone. It's an amazing property, 154 hectares. And I'm only showing this to you because I want to show you the glory of God. I want to show you the grace of God. I want to show you that God wants you to harvest in Jesus' name. 154 hectares. I didn't have the finances, but I had the word of God. We didn't have the resources, but we have the promises of God. He's a way maker. He's a miracle worker. He's a promise keeper. He's the light of the world. Amen. But there's a time of accountability. He's the Lord of all. We are stewards. There's a real struggle, but we will be held accountable. In Matthew 25, verse 20, he said, So he who received five talents came and bought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. I've gained five more talents. His Lord said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Now look at this. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Because he was productive under God's leadership of his time, his talent, and his resources. In 22, he also received two talents and said, Lord, you have delivered to me two talents. Look, I've gained two more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many. Enter into the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord. Look at verse 24. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you've not sown, gathering where you've not scattered. And I was afraid and I went and hid the talent in the ground. Look, here is what you, is yours. But as Lord said, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I've not scattered. So you ought to have at least deposited the money with the bankers. At my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who's got talent talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given and he will have an abundance. But from whom he who does not have, even what he has will be taken away and cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, he's not talking about people who are struggling because they haven't got resources or can't work because they have health issues. He's, it's not about money. Tell your neighbor, it's not about money. <laughs> this is about stewardship of time, talent, and treasure. And if you're not multiplying what God gave you, God's way, there is a reckoning, a time of accountability. And it's not talking about hell. It's a Semitic phrase that's re referring to when he says weeping and gnashing of teeth in outer darkness, it's referring to extreme regret. I don't know about you, but in my university years, I didn't serve the Lord with passion. I fell into human reasoning and I did things that I really regret. How many of you have had a life, there's portions of your life that you regret? Just put up your hands, please. Join me, shame the devil and join me. <laughs> and confess it to the Lord. We come under the grace of God, but there's parts of our lives that we regret. But this is now God is saying, if you don't do it, building the house on the rock, you're going to have extreme regret because you're going to look back and you're going to recognize I missed what God called me to do. As a pastor and the founder of this church, as the father of this church, it's my responsibility to prepare you that you have no regrets. Life is short. Eternity is real but people matter most. I care about you. We love you. We, we're proud of you as a church. But when you enter into the presence of God and you come into a time of accountability, have you served him for his vision or yours? You see, the word of God says that when you love him, he manifests himself to you. And the reason why we can trust the Lord as owner of all with great joy, that we are stewards, the struggle is real, and we will be held accountable 
We need, we need to recognize, yes, life is tough. Tell your neighbor, yeah, life is tough. Life is tough. But you might get bam. Say with me, bam. bam. But it's coming back. Bing. <laughs> bam. 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 Bing. In 2024, let God fill us with his abilities, his dunamis. His, let him upskill us. Let's come under the blood of Jesus. Let's build our house on the rock. And I invite the worship team up as they come up this morning. Can I remind you the prodigals are coming home? God's throwing out a net to harvest. I believe he's bringing hope for us. He's bringing joy. There's going to be a supernatural move in our country where there's going to be a change for God's glory. Can I ask you to stand this morning? Let's give the Lord a clap. Thank you, Father. As you stand before the Lord, let's recognize the Lord is owner of all. We are stewards. The struggle is real. We will be held accountable. I would like you to consider this as you stand. Just look at this document, this document that goes up. There's a, there's a certificate that goes up this morning. This is something Helen and I did in Crown Ministries some years ago. Can I ask you to consider, is God Lord over all? This is going to go out on on WhatsApp messages. And I'd like you to consider taking this quit claim deed and consider what do you own that you need to give back to the Lord? Not to the church, not to the pastor, to the Lord. For Helen and I, we put our car there, we put our financial bank account, we, we put the house there, we put everything that we had, we put it underneath and we gave it to the Lord. And we are no longer the owners. God is. We're simply the stewards, knowing that we're going to be held accountable to the Lord. Can I ask you to consider taking that certificate home and going before God? Because I believe many of us, many of us here are running your companies, running your position at work, running relationships in family as if you're the owner. And I believe the Lord's saying, I want to give you a harvest, but make me the owner. Make Jesus the owner. Let him be the owner and you be the steward, then he can entrust you with more in Jesus' name. Can you bow your heads, please? Father, we want to ask for forgiveness for not even consulting you over how we handle money, how we handle your skills, your talent. We've been selfish, thinking it's our skills, nothing for Mahala waiting to be paid before we offer grace and service to honor you. So help us to come back to the place where you are Lord of all, we're the stewards, where we recognize the struggle is real, but there's a time of accountability and you give us dunamis, power, the power of God, supernatural grace, to walk in love with a sound, disciplined mind that brings you glory by us bearing fruit in Jesus' name. Amen. As we worship the Lord this morning, if you recognize that you have been running your business, your bank accounts, your job as yours, instead of being a steward, can I encourage you to repent where you are? Can I encourage you to come and lay before the Lord, kneel at the altar prophetically and give it back to him? Because he wants to multiply the bread. He wants to multiply the fish. He wants to pull the money out of the fish's mouth. He wants to bring in the prodigals. He wants a harvest in the Swatini that glorifies God. That is what he needs to become a pulpit to Africa. In Jesus' name, he needs you. Are you ready? In Jesus' name, amen.